The next chapter that we are going to start with is Anatomy of Flowering Plants. In the plant kingdom, both unicellular and multicellular members are present. In the case of unicellular, the same cell performs all the functions. But as evolution progressed, cells became organized into distinct groups called tissues to perform specific functions. Here, we are going to study the internal structure of flowering plants. The branch of botany, which deals with the study of internal structures and organization of plants or plant organs, is called plant anatomy. Plant anatomy can also be called as phytotomy. The internal organization with reference to structure and function are commonly studied in this branch. N. Gru is known as father of plant anatomy. He was an English plant anatomist and physiologist. The plant we see today are the result of 470 million years of evolution. Flowering plants are the most diverse with around 2,95,000 species. The diversity that we see in the plant kingdom is the result of their adaptations to the varying environment. You might have wondered how the present wide variety of plants came into existence. Let's see, in the early stages of earth and its atmosphere, they might have undergone a lot of physical as well as chemical changes like temperature fluctuations, change in pressure, humidity and even salinity in the case of ocean and so on. We know that during the early stages of earth, species might have been very less. But over a period of time, they had been exposed to these changes. These changes made them to develop certain adaptive features to survive those harsh conditions. You should bear in mind that this phenomenon of adaptation was going on all around the earth. That's how so many species of plants and animals developed over a period of time at different places. We observe these diversities through their morphological characters, morphological, external morphological characters. Similarly, internal structures also show adaptations to diverse environment. That is, when uh, the atmosphere, atmospheric fluctuations occur, the body of the plant should change accordingly to adjust with the fluctuations so certain adaptive features also develop internally got it so external as well as internal adaptations develop according to the changes that occur uh, in the environment so that's anatomy that study is the anatomy of plants i hope you might have got an idea about the term anatomy let's move further into the plant body that is anatomical structure of plant first of all first of all let's get into the structure that is basic structures they are cells and tissues we know that tissues are made up of a group of similar cells that are adapted for a particular function to get a complete and broad idea about the plant tissues you should bring the picture of a beautiful plant with flaws into your mind and imagine the tissues from shoot tip to root tip. The term tissue was coined by Gru, or the father of anatomy. Okay, and Gru, he's, uh, he's the father of plant anatomy. The tissues of a vascular plant are classified into two on the basis of their capacity of division by Carl Nageli. Carl Nageli, he was a Swiss botanist. He classified tissues of vascular plants into two. They are meristematic tissues and permanent tissues. Okay, vascular plants. I told you the classification of vascular plants. What are vascular plants? They are nothing but higher plants. That is, they have vascular tissues like xylem and phloem for the conduction of water and minerals, minerals as well as food prepared uh, in the leaves. 
got it just like the uh, the blood vascular system of higher plant uh, sorry higher animals so here the classification is like meristematic tissues and permanent tissues meristem that term that came from the word meristos that mean its meaning is divided the meristematic tissues are undifferentiated tissues they have the capacity to divide and they are composed of immature cells we can compare them with an infant that means that much soft and their body cells are very active and they are always in division the second group is the permanent tissue they are fully differentiated differentiated in the sense they are specialized with specific functions they are developed from meristematic tissues gradually the meristematic tissues undergo maturation and finally they develop into what to call permanent tissues okay so that they develop from the meristematic tissues by losing their capacity of division so they are mature cells characteristics of meristematic tissues the zone where the cells exist is known as meristem the area where the meristematic tissues or meristematic cells are seen is known as meristem the meristematic tissues are in a continuous state of division so here all the cells are immature but in the case of permanent tissues they are mature and these cells are seen in the region of growth like root tip stem tip and in the axillary buds another very important characteristic feature is cells are meristematic cells are spherical and small spherical or polygonal but they are small you see this point is quite simple and easy to remember but it is very important in the entrance point of view this particular character that is a small and spherical nature is the most important characteristic feature of meristematic tissues it's a core character for the totipotency and efficiency of meristem you must be wondering how can a small such small cell be so efficient we are going to discuss about that after a while but before that let's talk about the basic characters okay the next characteristic feature is the cell wall it is flexible the cell wall is flexible and meristematic tissues have only one cell wall that's primary cell wall they do not have secondary cell wall this cell wall is flexible and made up of cellulose and this particular nature contributes to the capacity of division because the cell wall is very flexible and they have only one cell wall so there will not be any resistance against the division next is they have dense cytoplasm so inner to the uh, inner to the cell wall the cytoplasm that cytoplasm is dense okay and they have a prominent and large nucleus and that particular nucleus large nucleus contains sufficient dna necessary for the division and differentiation into permanent tissues okay all the above mentioned characters make a cell metabolically active the last characteristic feature that is they have high surface area per unit volume and high nucleocytoplasmic ratio these two terms might be unfamiliar to you don't worry i will try to make you understand these points we are going to discuss these points under another subheading that is the regulatory factors of cell size already we discussed about the size of the cell i told you they are very small and this small size is very important for the activeness of the cell for the efficiency of the cell how does this small size of the cell benefit let's see the size of the cell is regulated by three important characters first one is nucleocytoplasmic ratio second one nucleo i'm sorry second one surface area to volume ratio and third one rate of metabolism first one let's talk about the first one that is nucleocytoplasmic ratio it can also be called as karyoplasmic ratio 
if the nucleus remains smaller and the amount of cytoplasm increases, the tiny nucleus will not be able to take care of the entire cytoplasmic content and organelles. So, the nucleus should be capable enough to take care of the entire cell. For that, the nucleus should be bigger enough. Okay. Active cells have high nucleocytoplasmic ratio. The nucleocytoplasmic ratio is a measurement in the cell biology. It is the ratio of the size or the volume of the nucleus to the size of the cytoplasm. A young cell nucleus occupies 25% of the cell volume. Here, just recollect the point that meristematic cells have prominent and large nucleus. So, prominent and large nucleus is essential to be an efficient cell. The nucleocytoplasmic ratio indicates uh, the maturity of the cell. How is it possible? You see, when the cell is young, its nucleus is very big. But as the cell matures, the size of the nucleus generally decreases. This reduced ratio either induces the cell to divide or undergoes maturation or senescence. That means when the size actually decreases, that is an indication or it induces the cell to divide. Otherwise, it enters the state of maturation or it enters the state which is known as the final state or senescence. That means death of the cell. Let's take an example of uh, erythrocytes. Okay, uh, the young and immature cells of erythrocytes are known as blast cells. These blast cells start their uh, activity with an NC ratio of 4 is to 1 which decreases as they mature to 2 is to 1. Bear in mind that erythrocytes, mature erythro erythrocyte does not have a nucleus but the blast cells or the young immature cells have uh, what to say nucleus. The next factor that regulates the cell size is surface area to volume ratio. Surface area, that's the area of outer part or outermost layer, here the plasma membrane. Volume, the amount of space enclosed within the cell, here the protoplasm. Let's try to get an idea about this ratio. To understand this, let's consider two situations. In the first situation, consider this prism as a cell with equal sides, each with one centimeter. If we have to calculate the area, we need to multiply length and breadth. Here, there are six sides in this cube. So, length into breadth into six. That is, six square centimeter. Then, if we calculate volume, length into breadth into height. So, we get one cubic centimeter. If we find out the area of area to volume ratio, it's going to be six is to one. Then, in the second situation, let's increase the size of the cell by 2 cm. That means each side with 2 cm. In this case, area 2 into 2 into 6, that forms 24 square cm. Volume 2 into 2 into 2, that is 8 cubic cm. The ratio would be 24 is to 8. After simplification, we get 3 is to 1. Just compare the situation 1 and 2. In the first situation, the ratio is 6 is to 1. In the second situation, the ratio is 3 is to 1. That is, with the increase, that is, area to volume ratio of the cell goes on decreasing as the size of the cell increases. That is, smaller cells have more area to volume ratio. Then, what would be the benefit of the cell size being small? You see, a cell has a large number of micro as well as macro molecules that are essential for their normal functioning. Volume of a cell indicates the amount of these molecules and the biological activities going on in it. For its functioning, a cell requires nutrition and oxygen that should enter the cell through plasma membrane and has to release waste products to outside. For this for this to and from motion, the surface area of plasma membrane should be greater. 
surface area of a cell determine this exchange of materials. If we consider the above two situations, in the first situation, one cubic centimeter volume of protoplasm is found in six square centimeter surface area that is plasma membrane. In the second situation, one cubic centimeter in three square centimeter. Here the first situation has sufficient surface area for the exchange than second. Metabolically active cells are usually small with higher surface volume ratio for quick exchange of materials and they are more efficient. As we know meristematic cells are small and spherical. Here we proved that meristematic cells are small and they are metabolically active, more efficient and totipotent. As they are metabolically active, they do not have reserved food materials as well. Requirement of energy is more because they are dividing cells. Biological molecules are continuously used for the release of energy. What about the vacuoles? Vacuoles are very small and sometimes completely absent. You keep, you keep in mind that metastomatic cells without vacuoles divide rapidly. Vacuoles provide rigidity to cell, thus prevent rapid division. It's a high yield MCQ. Let's move on to the next character. Cell organelles are usually non-functional, but mitochondria are functional. Got it? It's also an important point. Ergastic substances, they are non-living, are absent. Plastids are absent. But immature protoplastids are present. It's very important. Plastids are absent, but immature protoplastids are present in meristematic tissues. That's all about the characteristic features of meristematic tissues. As I told you, meristematic tissues are actively dividing tissues. When they divide, a major part of the resultant cells undergo maturation and differentiation. Then they emerge as three broad categories of secondary tissues. They are dermal tissues, vascular tissues and ground tissues. Dermal tissues covers, cover and protect the plant. They are obviously going to be the outermost part of the plant like our skin. Vascular tissues, they transport water and minerals and sugar like our blood vascular system. Third one, the ground tissue, they serve as site for photosynthesis, support vascular tissues and store nutrients like our muscles. This classification is very important in the entrance point of view. You may get a few high yield MCQs here. One question can be, dermal tissues come from, options A, options, first option A, vascular tissue, B, ground tissue, C, meristematic tissue, D, all the above. The answer would be meristematic tissue. Second question, the tissue which form, the tissue which forms the outermost epidermis to protect the root hair, options, meristem, Vascular tissues, sieve tubes, dermal tissues. The answer is dermal tissues. That's all about metastomatic tissues and their properties, their important characters. Hope you got an overall idea about metastomatic tissues and their characters. I will explain further things in the coming video. Till then, take care. Thank you for watching.